event in San Francisco and got talking about this subject of nutrition and <clears throat> what was going on with sugar and discovered a mutual interest there. And I was thrilled when about a year later he came out with his Sugar the Bitter Truth and it started to go viral. I confess I had some concern at the time that he was being perceived and characterized as one of these fringe lunatic types uh, because of what he was saying. And I was worried about what is called the Semmelweis effect. For those of you who don't know Semmelweis, Semmelweis was a doctor in 1847 who suggested that it would be a good idea for doctors to wash their hands before they delivered babies. <laughs> they were coming literally straight from the morgue where they were doing autopsies and delivering them. They couldn't figure out why the death rate among mothers who were delivering by doctors was a factor of five times what it was from midwives who actually washed their hands before they treated their children. The, the Semmelweis effect is that uh, he was so excoriated and so disapproved of, he ultimately was sent and put into an insane asylum where two weeks after he got in, they beat him to death. So I was <clears throat> concerned for my <laughs> colleague that the big pharma and big food were gonna come after him. Now, to, to be fair, Rob has addressed this form, not this form, but the MIT group, uh, starting in 2012, then again in 2013, and again in 2016. I, I happen to have here his latest book, which he has signed for me, probably. This book is so amazing, I have given it to all four of my adult children. Uh, it, it is truly a delightful book to read, depressing in places, but it's actually very empowering because it allows you to take advantage of all the cool things that Rob has done and put them in a way that you can actually read your own lipid panel and have a meaningful discussion with your family doctor who's trying to prescribe X, Y, and Z and actually have a meaningful discussion with him. The, the blinding irony to this is that he has been this voice crying in the wilderness all these years, and yesterday on NPR, they had a special on ultra-processed foods, which I remember Rob's discussion was, uh, <clears throat> it was once upon a time called adult onset diabetes, but then was too many kids got us, we called it type two diabetes, and he thoughtfully said it's actually ultra-processed food disease, and I'll let him uh, go into that, and it's, it's fascinating to have, I, I, I cannot resist, I have to, pardon the glasses, <clears throat> when you're class of 76, you get to use glasses at this point. Uh, but you have the FDA's first Deputy Commissioner for Human Foods says focusing on these three ingredients, sodium, sugar, and saturated fat, will make people aware of their risks because, quote, the science around added sugars, saturated fat, and sodium intake is quite clear. That is something that Rob has been saying for over 20 years. So with that, please welcome my dear friend Rob Lustig, and he's going to give you a very
you know, for me and probably for all of you, probably nothing in your career will ever, you know, meet the bar of, you know, getting that diploma uh, at, from MIT. You know, basically is bigger than anything else. And, and I always feel that way. And so, and I have more than just love and affection for the place. And so I will come and talk to you guys anytime. It is truly my pleasure. Um, <clears throat> Having said that, Reynolds, uh, I never said that saturated fat was bad. <laughs> they did. They did. They did. I never said that. Um, there are fats that are bad, but saturated fat is actually not one of them. Saturated fat is cardiovascularly neutral. It's not good, not bad. There are fats that are bad, like trans fats. Trans fats are the devil incarnate. We'll talk about them in a minute. Okay? But they've come out of our food. And the question is, okay, now that they've come out of our food, what's the biggest boogeyman? And the answer to that is sugar. But it's not the only one. There are others. And so we're going to talk about that today. Can everyone hear me okay? No. No? All right. Let's, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. So, so much for... Uh, so, so much for mechanical engineering. Let's see if we can make this work. Yeah. <laughs> Much better, right? Okay. <clears throat> Usually no one has any trouble hearing you. Uh, so, uh, tonight's talk is called The True Purpose of Nutrition, and you'll see why in a minute. So I have good news and bad news. The good news is that every single one of you was imbued by God with this shiny red Lamborghini. <laughs> the bad news is that it didn't come with an insurance policy or an owner's, owner's manual. And your job is to keep that shiny red Lamborghini from turning into this jalopy down here. That's your job, okay? And if you fail, you're screwed. It's just that simple. By the way, um, I'm from Brooklyn. Are there any children here? <laughs> yes? How old are you? How old are you? Uh, uh, 14. I have to, I'll have to watch my head. <laughs> yeah, right. She knows more words than you. <laughs> Uh, it, it, you know, it's, uh, when you're from Brooklyn, it, you know, you're just sort of rolls Brooklyn. out. Huh? You're teaching in Brooklyn. Yeah, well, got to, got to, got to be careful. Okay. Anyway, that's that's what today tonight is about, and the question is, you know, what's gone on? How has it happened? And how do we fix the problem so that everybody can maintain their uh, their their wheels? Okay. And we're going to use the car analogy a fair amount tonight. Next slide. So uh, before I start, you know, I'm an academic, you know, I have disclosures. I did write these books for the general public, Metabolical being the most recent, and uh, virtually everything that I'm going to talk about tonight is in that book. Uh, I am also, since I've retired from UCSF clinically, I still do research and I still do policy and what have you, but since I retired clinically, I am now able to do other things, which includes being a chief medical officer for four companies, a paid advisor to four others, and an unpaid advisor to a whole bunch of other things which we're gonna talk about tonight. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, so in 2001, this paper came out in Nature. And what it said was that at that time, there were 151 million people with diabetes walking the earth. And what was projected for a decade later, 2010, was that that number would graduate up from 151 to 221 million. That's a 46% increase or an annualized inflation rate of 3.88% as the actuaries would do it. This is not what we saw. What we actually saw, next slide, is that that number was 285 million. That's an annualized inflation rate of 6.88%, a doubling over what was anticipated. By 2014, the number had gone up to 422 million. That's an annualized inflation rate of 10.3%, a tripling over 
what was anticipated. And remember, this is while the obesity epidemic is rampaging and all the doctors are screaming about diet and exercise and gym memberships are going up and, you know, uh, you know, low fat and everything else. And, you know, the world's attention was, you know, singularly focused on this problem. This is only getting worse. Next slide. By 2019, we were up to 463 million. That, that by 2020, by, sorry, by 2030, we are now expected to be at 568 million. And by 2050, 785 million people with diabetes. Okay, but it really won't matter because we'll have immolated the planet by then. <laughs> In part because of this problem. You will see why. Next slide. Now, here we see uh, hospital costs in red, physician costs in green, and pharma costs in purple. They do not add up to the total costs because the rest of it is due to the care and treatment of chronic metabolic disease like diabetes, like cancer, like dementia. Okay? Not necessarily in hospitals, but just in general. Okay? The question is, what's going on? How come we in America spend the most on healthcare, 19% of GDP right now, and get the worst outcomes. As you can see from here, looking at life expectancy. Now, we never had the best life expectancy, as you can see down here, but at least we were with the pack. You know, these are the OECD countries, until about 1975 when we started falling off the rails. And now, we are over here, okay? And, next slide, we, if you're looking at life expectancy, we here in the United States are paying an eight-year longevity tax. Every single one of you. You are losing eight years of life for living here compared to, say, Japan. Everybody see it? Okay, and of course, in the last five years, we've actually decreased our life expectancy. This is COVID, of course, but the point was it was happening way before that. And the question is, why is this? And if, if you're um, obese, it's a 15-year longevity tax. And if you've got metabolic syndrome, which is chronic metabolic disease complicating obesity, that's a 20-year uh, longevity tax. And the question is, why is this? Well, the answer is because only 7% of America is metabolically healthy. 93% of Americans exhibit some form of metabolic dysfunction, and that includes the people in this room. And we're the good guys. You know, we're in California. We believe in food. We, we believe in exercise. I mean, what's going on, you know, e east of the Sierras is, you know, a, a crime, right? So you can imagine, right? Next slide. So if you take a look at this life expectancy and do it against healthcare expenditures, I mean, just look at that. I mean, the bottom line is we spend more and more to get less and less. This is not the law of diminishing returns. This is actually making things worse. That's what we are doing. We are making things worse. And Medicare will be broke by the year 2026 which is three year, two years from now, and Social Security will be broke by the year 2034. Now, I'll be very honest with you. I'm gonna be 72 in 2034, and I want my friggin' Medicare and Social Security. <laughs> because I worked really hard for it, and so did you, okay? And it's not gonna be there for you because of this, because of chronic metabolic disease. Years ago, I went to a meeting at MIT on the fate of Social Security. It was uh, run by, it was uh, actually from, uh, uh, sponsored by the uh, head of Social Security from Mexico. And it had Lenny Guarenti from MIT talking about uh, 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 what was he talking about? He was, he was talking about uh, aging, uh, 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 they had Jonathan Gruber, who was talking about pensions. They had, they had a whole bunch of people. And then I got up and talked about chronic disease and the fact that it didn't really matter what anything else was doing because the rest of it was basically just shifting um, you know, uh, the uh, deck chairs on the Titanic. Unless you fix the chronic metabolic disease problem, none of the other things, none of the other um, uh, levers 
would matter. And ultimately, the whole last hour of that was only about chronic disease, all right? We had six really smart people and they couldn't talk about anything but chronic disease. So this is where the linchpin is, okay? And these were MIT professors. Next slide. This is my favorite Dilbert. Anybody still read Dilbert? Yeah. Since, <laughs> since Scott Adams got his you know, tip in the ringer. Um, health problems and absenteeism are a huge cost to this business. So give me a raise or I'll eat unhealthy food and avoid all forms of exercise. You already do those things. How could you possibly know that? <laughs> Next slide. And here's why. This is the reason, because everybody wants the pill. Everybody wants the pill. Next slide. Well, we don't have a pill, we have the shot, right? Yeah. So the question is, is this the, is this the answer? Is Ozempic the answer? Uh, go back. Is Ozempic the answer? And I, I'm here to tell you that I'm, as a, as a clinician, as a pediatric endocrinologist, I'm glad Ozempic's here. I'm glad that Wagovi's here. I'm glad that, you know, Manjaro and Zepbound and the ones that are coming, you know, forward in the future. I'm glad they're here because people need help now. But if you think this is the answer, I have a bridge to sell you. Okay. This is a Band-Aid. And the reason is because this is not solving the problem because you have to solve a problem at the cause. Nobody has GLP-1 deficiency, right, Sophia? Not a soul, okay? They, they've looked for it. It doesn't exist. It does work, but it only works as long as you take it. And it's 1,300 a month and it causes equal amounts of muscle and fat loss, which is really bad for you. Ask any little old lady who breaks their hip whether she wishes she had a little bit more muscle, okay? Bottom line is this is a stopgap, and it has to be treated as such. You cannot take your eye off the ball. And I'm worried that this will make people take their eye off the ball. On Tuesday, I am actually doing a podcast for the Wall Street Journal because they're doing a whole series on GLP-1 analogs and what it's going to do to the American economy. And I am there very specifically to say, don't take your friggin' eye off the ball. Okay, got to fix the food, and you'll see why. Excellent. So let's talk about this. There are three terms, and unfortunately, the media and doctors, for that matter, Throw these three terms around indiscriminately. We have to define them because they're actually quite important. And here they are. Food science, nutrition, metabolic health. Okay? Food science is what happens to food between the ground and the mouth. Nutrition is what happens to food between the mouth and the cell. Metabolic health is what happens inside the cell. But all of these chronic diseases, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian disease, all these diseases that currently constitute 75% of all healthcare dollars spent in America are, are all metabolic health diseases. They're all inside the cell. Inside the cell. And we don't have medicines that get to where the problem is, because all of these are the diseases of mitochondria. Mitochondria, those little energy burning factories inside each of your cells, which produce this chemical energy called ATP. Every one of these diseases is ATP deficiency in whatever organ you're looking at. And the point is, we don't have a medicine that gets there, and certainly GLP-1s don't get there. So we have to solve the metabolic health problem. It's what happens inside the cell that matters. And that we are not dealing with. We have to deal with it. And the only way to deal with that is using a modality that gets to the mitochondria. Well, there's only one thing that gets to the mitochondria. Food. This is a food problem. There's no other way around it. There's no medicine for this. There's no pill for this. There never will be a pill for this. This is a food problem. Next slide. World Economic Forum actually recognized that. And I'm very proud of them. I was part of the uh, 24 physicians who weighed in on this as their scientific advisory team. And they came out with this white paper last year, a year ago now, that basically said, yes, the true purpose of nutrition is metabolic health. 
So that is, of course, the title of the talk. So we can all go home now, because we now know the answer. Not so fast. Uh, let's talk about it. Next slide. That is the true purpose of nutrition, metabolic health. Because if you don't solve the metabolic health problem, you, it doesn't really matter what you do with nutrition. It's all, it's all basically three-card monte after that. Next slide. So that's where this car analogy comes from. And so I want to pay homage to our patron saints of cars, <laughs> Ray and Tom. Clicking <laughs> clack the Tappet brothers, who unfortunately, uh, you know, Tom died, and Ray is not on uh, uh, NPR anymore. Okay, but you know who I'm talking about, right? MIT grads, proud and uh, you know, fierce, and me too, and you know, this is for them. Okay. Next slide. So there are eight, count them, eight things that go wrong inside cells. And we have to fix all eight in order to be metabolically healthy. This is the owner's manual. This is what you have to pay attention to for maintenance. Maintenance of your Ferrari, got it? First. Glycation, that would be, I'm not gonna do the biochemistry because there are a lot of non-biochemists in the room, but I think you can all relate to cars, right? Yeah. Who here does not have a car? <laughs> the 14 year old, okay, good, good. All right. we're, 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 we're talking to the right group. Right. Glycation, that would be like carbon deposits on your intake manifolds, okay, next. Oxidative stress would be like rusting of the chassis and of the body. Next, mitochondrial dysfunction would be like a defective transmission. Number four, insulin resistance would be like uh, a, a sand in your carburetor, okay? Instead of going vroom, vroom, you go putt, putt, right? Next, membrane integrity would be like an oil leak, okay? Number six, inflammation would be like rotted fuel lines that could catch fire, right? You ever see a fire under the hood of a car pulled to the side? That's why, next. Methylation would be like uh, defective spark plugs. So instead of running on a V4 or a V6, you're running on a V2, okay? And lastly, autophagy, which is my favorite. This is garbage nitrogen cell. This would be like oil sludge that you basically have to clear out with STP oil treatment, okay? <laughs> we need electric that? cars. Uh, sorry? We need electric cars, is what you're saying. Uh, All of those. Well, yeah, okay, fine, yeah, I'm not for that. Here's the problem. Here are the things that cause each of those eight subcellular pathologies. Notice, they're all food. They're all ultra-processed food. Okay, I'm not gonna read through them all, not necessary, you can see them. Okay, the point is, these eight things, there's no medicine for any of those. They are not druggable, but they are foodable. If you fix the food, these eight things go away. They get better. So until we fix the food, we can't fix the problem. So everyone's throwing money at this, you know, uh, uh, idea, that idea, this uh, program, that program, this healthcare, uh, uh, you know, modality, that healthcare modality. They're all junk until you fix the food. There is no way out, period. And that's a problem because people don't want to fix the food. Why don't they want to fix the food? Because they're addicted, that's why. Okay, because sugar in particular is addictive in, in, in the extreme. How many people do you know who say, oh, I have a horrible sweet tooth? That's sugar addiction until proven otherwise. Okay, so I like it into alcohol. 40% of Americans are teetotalers, never touch this stuff. 40% are social drinkers, you know, can pick up a beer, put it down, no problem. 10% are binge drinkers, and 10% are chronic alcoholics. Okay? Maybe it's the same thing. And in fact, we know it's the same thing because fructose, the sweet molecule in sugar, and alcohol are metabolized in the mitochondria the same way. So it shouldn't be surprising that children 
get the diseases of alcohol, type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease, used to be the diseases of alcohol before they became the diseases of five-year-olds. But five-year-olds don't drink alcohol. But boy, oh boy, do they consume the alternative. And it's affecting their mitochondria exactly the same way. This is not rocket science. And that's one of the reasons why when I was talking, you know, speaking out in, in the middle of the wilderness that Reynolds was, uh, you know, describing, I knew the science was on my side. I knew that this was going to come around. Okay, it took a while because everybody and his brother was, you know, railing against it. The fact of the matter is, you know, this is now a thing. Okay, and now, you know, NPR announced ultra processed sugar is actually bad for you. Hooray! You know, only took what 17 years. <laughs> Now, people say, wait a second, I can outrun this. You know, I can, I can exercise, and that will solve this problem. Exercise is the second best thing for you, okay? It is not the best thing for you. Fixing the food is best. We actually have the data on that. For those of you who are statisticians, if you change the food, the R value, uh, sorry, the hazard risk ratio, nothing. The hazard risk ratio goes to 0 0.75, so it's below one, so that's protective, that's good, okay? If you exercise, the, R of the uh, hazard risk ratio goes to 0 0.85. So it's good, I'm not saying it's bad, it's good, but it's not as good. And of the eight subcellular pathologies that we have to deal with, exercise only actually fixes four, and in fact, Oxidative stress is made worse by exercise. This is not the way to do it. So you cannot outrun a bad diet. You have to fix the food. There is no way around it. It's not about calories. It's about the food itself. Okay, next slide. So that leads us to, well, what is the food? Well, in America and in pretty much every Western country, it is now this stuff called ultra-processed food. 73% of the items in the American grocery store are ultra-processed food. The question is, is ultra-processed food food? <laughs> yes or no? Is it food? Next slide. So the question is, who called it that? <laughs> The food industry did, because they want you to believe it's food. The question is, is it? Okay, here's the definition of food. Substrate that contributes to either growth or burning of an organism. 100%, I am so totally uh, you know, in love with this definition. This is exactly right. If something does not contribute to growth or does not contribute to burning, then it is by definition not food. Okay, so let's look. Next slide. Let's look at burning first. Here's mitochondria right here, okay? So sugar is these two molecules right here, glucose and fructose. Glucose, you'll notice, is in green. Fructose, you'll notice, is in red. That's not by accident. That's on purpose. Glucose turns out to actually stimulate mitochondrial function, mitochondrial beta oxidation. That's why the upward green arrow here. It actually makes mitochondria work better. Glucose is a mitochondrial stimulator. And the reason is because it stimulates two enzymes, AMP kinase and this one down here, hydroxyase-CoA uh, uh, dehydrogenase, okay? In other words, glucose, for lack of a better word, we can call good. Fructose, on the other hand, inhibits three separate enzymes that normally contribute to mitochondrial function. It inhibits AMP kinase. It inhibits this enzyme down here called ACAD-L, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase long chain. And it inhibits this guy over here called CPT1A, carnitine palmitol transferase 1A, which is the shuttle mechanism by which fatty acids get into the mitochondria for burning in the first place. In other words, everything fructose does inhibits burning. Ron Kahn, the CEO of Joslin Diabetes Center at Harvard, said about this, the most important takeaway of this study is that high fructose in the diet is bad. It's not bad because it's more calories, but because of it has effects on the liver metabolism to make it worse at burning fat. And that's what you want to do, you want to burn fat, you don't want to store it, because when you store it, that's when you get into trouble. As a result, 
Adding fructose to the diet makes the liver store more fat, and this is bad for the liver and bad for whole body metabolism. Couldn't agree more. That's exactly right. Point is, it's not about calories. It's about the food itself. Okay? And because fructose is like alcohol, alcohol causes fatty liver, right? Prior to 1980, if you saw somebody with fatty liver, that was an alcoholic. But now five-year-olds have fatty liver disease. Next slide. What about growth? Well, this is work from my colleague, Dr. Efrat Monsenigo Ornan at Hebrew University, Jerusalem. She's head of the Department of Nutrition there. And she looked at the question, does, uh, not just sugar, but ultra-processed food contribute to or inhibit growth? Well, here's bone from a control animal and one treated with ultra-processed food. Here's their cortical porosity. Here's what happens to the cross-sectional area. Here's the mechanical properties, the tensile strength, the fracture risk right here. Okay. Here's the cortical bone. You can see here, nice cortical bone. And it's basically all thinned out. Okay. And here are the holes in the bone, the osteoporosis. You want to know why women are getting osteoporosis? It's not, it has nothing to do with estrogen. It has nothing to do with calcium. It has to do with their food. That's why none of these have fixed the problem. Because until you fix the food, you can't fix the problem. And we haven't fixed the food. Next slide. So what the question the is... What the animals in the, for the bone? Sorry? What is the animal for the bone studies? Those were rats. Those were rats. Okay. So I'm going to show you a bunch of papers now, just in succession, okay, real quick. This is correlation, not causation, but we have causation for f sugar and four diseases. But let's just run it, you just have to hit it once, okay? Obesity, hypertension, type two diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, keep it going, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, metabolic syndrome, Crohn's disease, that's my favorite, uh, cancer, uh, dementia, uh, depression, that's a big one, and finally, early death, okay? Every single chronic metabolic disease correlates with ultra-processed food consumption. Now, the question is cause or effect. Well, this is correlation, but it takes into account all of the uh, 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 confounding factors. This was work done by Sapien Labs out of uh, Washington and New York City. Ultra-processed food consumption and mental well-being. We have an adolescent depression nightmare on our hands. Next slide. And it turns out, next slide, turns out that when you look, exercise does not fix the problem, and it has nothing to do with income. Ultra-processed food is a primary variable in the development of depression Where across the board. Sorry? What is the abscissa? The abscissa, it, well, rarely to several times a day. Okay? The bottom line is, it's about the food. Okay? It's not explained by economics or politics or geography or race or obesity or sex or age or anything else. The food is a primary variable that does not go away when you even adjust for all the content. Next slide. Okay, so what is ultra-processed food, right? Because that's what we have to identify. That's what we have to, you know, uh, keep our eye on. My colleague, Dr. Carlos Montero, uh, at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, developed this classification system called the NOVA system, the new system in Portuguese. And uh, I, the easiest way to explain the NOVA system is by example. So I will show you the four classes of the NOVA system. Class one is an apple. Class two would be apple slices, de stem, de seeded, de skin, baby. Nova class three would be apple sauce, macerated, cooked, uh, possibly with a preservative added. And finally, Nova class four would be a McDonald's apple pie. <laughs> the question is, is there any of that class one in this class four? Is it even apple? Is it? Only McDonald's is sure. for sure. <laughs> okay. Point is, this is the stuff, next slide. This is the stuff right here that we have to be concerned about, which is 57% of US consumption and 73% of the US food supply. This is what we're talking about. Basically, 
What you have to do is you have to walk into your grocery store and say, we need to put a padlock on this because this is the source of the poison. Okay? If they were selling poison, we wouldn't have any trouble keeping our kids out of it. Okay? But that's what's going on. So, of course, the food industry will tell you that processed food is very important for nutritious and sustainable diets. That's what they wrote, World Business Council for Sustainable Development. I would tell you, that's me, processed food is an experiment that failed. We were actually all guinea pigs back in the mid-1960s when they started introducing uh, ultra-processed food. We didn't sign any informed consent, but basically they did an experiment on us, and we did it fully willingly, although without informed consent, and now we are paying the cost of that failed experiment. Next slide. So, you will hear people talk about food as medicine. Yeah, food can be medicine, but food can also be poison. And the question is, how do you tell the difference? How do you tell which is which? Because if you could tell which was which, maybe you could do something about it, right? That's what the rest of tonight is about. And maybe another 20 minutes or so. Next slide. This is my favorite slide. I love this slide. Because the US government made it so. This is actually something that was not done, shall we say, out of malice. You know, like some sociopath, you know, took the reins of government and said, let's F the entire US population. <laughs> they didn't do that, okay? They did it ostensibly for reasons that made sense at the time, but ultimately this is where it got us. And it's been going on for over 200 years. It started in 1790 with the sugar tariff, the second oldest piece of legislation on the books in America, okay? We still have it today. The sugar tariff is still in place today. This ostensibly was to help promote U.S. sugar growers against foreign competition. Okay, it's still there. 1933, the Dust Bowl and the farm, the original farm bill, because we had a destitute population in the Southwest and all the food was in the Northeast. But if you just put the food on railroad cars and shipped it to the Southwest, by the time they got to the Southwest, the food would be rancid. So they had to do something to stop the degradation of the food on the way to trying to save a destitute population. So what they do? They processed it. They got rid of the germ, they got rid of the fiber, all the stuff that was good for you. The germ had the flavonoids and the biotin and the, the nucleic acids, etc. and the vitamins were all in the germ, okay? And the husk, the fiber, was actually the food for your microbiome. Well, they had to strip all that away and send the starch, send the endosperm, send you know these big ten-pound bags of flour so they could bake it up, you know, uh, in you know in, in, in you know near the Hoover Dam where you know people were dying, and they, we saved a destitute population because of it. And this actually made sense all the way through World War II, but then it stopped making sense. But what did we do? Did we retire it? No, we doubled down because people said, hey, we can make money at this. And so ultra-processed food started you know, becoming de rigueur. It started being the, the real, you know, the, the only thing we, we, we concentrated on. And of course it raised GDP and we could sell it abroad. 1971, in the midst of all of the political turmoil, Richard Nixon recognized that fluctuating food prices caused political unrest. And we know that because when we sent 10% um, uh, of our corn crop to ethanol in 2008, that caused rice riots in Thailand and caused the ouster of their prime minister because that's how global this is. So Nixon knew that, and so he sent his agriculture secretary, Earl Butts, to the middle of the heartland, to Nebraska and Kansas and Iowa, and said three things. Row to row, furrow to furrow, get bigger, get out. And that started monoculture. That's why all the corn's in Iowa and all the cattle are in Kansas. And that's why we have to spray the corn with nitrogen fertilizer, which causes the nitrogen runoff, which is causing the eutrophication of the Gulf of Mexico. And the cattle, because they don't have legumes to eat, they're not getting the nutrients they need, so they're getting sick, so we have to pump them full of antibiotics. 
Okay, and the antibiotics then kill the bacteria in the cow's intestine. Well, guess what? We're eating that though the result of those antibiotics. Do you ever go into the um, store and look at the meat that they sell? It's all what marbled, and we prize that marbling like it's good, right? Anybody ever been to Argentina? They, they, they eat double the meat we do. New Zealand, they eat double the meat we do. They have a lower incidence of heart disease and diabetes than we do. Eating twice the meat, why? Because their meat is not marble, because their cows graze on grass, which is what they're supposed to do. That's why they have four stomachs. Okay? But our meat is marble. That's intramyocellular lipid. That is fat in the muscle. That animal has metabolic syndrome. That cow should be killed at 18 months of age. We kill it at six months of age because it's already reached its adult size because of this uh, fattening them up, okay? Well, that's what's happening to us. We have what the cows have. The only difference is nobody locked off our heads. We're just putting ourselves in the ground instead. 1977, everybody remember the McGovern Commission? Yes, no? Everybody remember the first dietary guidelines for Americans? Okay, said, eat less fat. Well, if you take the fat out of the food, it tastes like cardboard. The food industry knew that. what they do? Added the sugar. <laughs> Snack levels. Two grams of fat down, 13 grams of carbohydrate up, four of which are sugar, all because of the dietary guidelines. 1980, Hurricane Allen. Anybody heard of Hurricane Allen? Never hit the United States. Destroyed the Caribbean sugar crop. And that's what started high fructose corn syrup. Okay, we, the high fructose corn syrup was invented in Japan, but in fact, Coca-Cola and all the other food industry concerns were afraid of it initially. They said, this doesn't taste right. But then when Hurricane Allen came, we needed a, uh, locally grown, produced, sustainable, non-stop sugar supply. And so we started substituting high fructose corn syrup for regular sugar. Everybody remember New Coke, 1985? That was the switch from sucrose to high fructose corn syrup. We rebelled. They went back to Coke Classic. Well, you know what? Coke Classic disappeared because they just slid it in under the wire. You're all drinking New Coke now. <laughs> 1986, the FDA reviewed the data on sugar and said, inconclusive, inconclusive. And the reason they said that was because this was before the advent of high fructose corn syrup because when high fructose corn syrup hit our shores, the spike in sugar consumption was like double. We went from 51 me grams median per day to 102 grams. And all the data was on 51 not on 102. We need to do that uh, uh, analysis again. And I've actually uh, uh, talked with Tom Vilsack, the head of the USDA, about having to do this again now. 1990, the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act of 1990, what gave us nutrition facts on the side of your uh, package. Okay, I have a question for you. It says percent carbohydrate, it says total carbohydrate, and then there's a number next to it right? It's called the percent DV, percent daily value. Everybody knows what we're talking about? And then underneath it, it says total sugars and then added sugar sometimes. Is there a number next to that? No. Why is there no number next to that? Because they don't want you to know. Because everything would be over 100%. That's on purpose, that they're not telling you. 1994, the Dietary Supplement and uh, uh, Health and Education Act of 1994, which basically let dietary supplements onto the market without being tested. Okay. And lastly, 1997, the Food Safety Modernization Act, or FISMA, uh, which basically farmed out the generally recognized as safe list to the food companies. When the grass list was first uh, thought up, by the USDA in 1958, there were 170 items that were thought to be generally recognized as safe. Today there are 10,000. Do you really think there are 10,000 things you can put in your body that won't kill you? Really? Next slide. 
So the World Economic Forum looked at this question of, is this a good deal? This ultra processed food, is it a good deal? So if you look at the global uh, 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 profit for the food industry on an annual basis, it is $9 trillion a year. If you look at the healthcare costs globally, it is $11 trillion a year. If you look at the environmental costs for this problem, it is $7 trillion a year. And if you look at the productivity cost, it's another $1 trillion a year. So when you do the math, we have a $10 trillion a year deficit cleaning up the mess that the food industry made. That's what we have. The question is, is that sustainable? The answer, of course, is impossible. And that's what we've got. And that's why everything's going to hell in a handbasket. All because we're supporting this thing that's killing us. Next slide. So, now let's talk about what we can do. The goal, metabolic health, right? The true purpose of nutrition, metabolic health. How do you do it? All right, two ways. Promote metabolism, inhibit inflammation. Those are the two basic precepts. If you promote mitochondrial function and you inhibit systemic inflammation, you can solve this problem. Unfortunately, ultra-processed food does the opposite. So how do you fix this? Next slide. So, Michael Pollan is a personal friend. He's been to my house for dinner, okay? Along with Michael Krasny, it was a hell of a night. It was great. It was terrific. Okay? But I will take issue with this, okay? He wrote this in the New York Times Magazine several years ago and then wrote a book called Food Rules, okay? And he said, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Everybody remember that? Seven words, three clauses. There's something wrong with every one of those clauses. Eat food. Well, you know, what does that mean? First of all, is ultra-processed food food? No, okay, well, but even, you know, some people need a low-fat diet, some people need a high-fat diet. It depends on who you are. Eat food doesn't answer that question. Not too much. It doesn't take into account mitochondrial dysfunction. If you have mitochondrial dysfunction, the not too much doesn't really mean much, does it? And finally, mostly plants, just remember, Coke, Doritos, and Oreos are all vegan. <laughs> It's not what's in the food, it's what's been done to the food that matters, okay? And that is not on the food label. You cannot look at a food label and figure that out. You actually can if you know what you're looking for and you know some science and you know some math. You can actually figure it out. But you can't expect, like everyone in America, to be reading every food label and doing math calculations in the grocery store. That's not going to work. So I suggest instead three different principles, and these are all in the book. Okay, next slide. What we uh, call this is the metabolic matrix. It is three things, three clauses. Okay? It is feed the gut, protect the liver, support the brain. Now why those three? Because if you look at the science, if you fix those three organs, the downstream organs get better. If you fix the downstream organs, like the heart or the pancreas, those three organs do not get better. Therefore, those three organs are primary and the others are secondary. So you have to focus on these three. When you fix these three, you get healthy. And it doesn't even matter what the food is. If, the, if a food does all three of these, it is healthy, whether it's processed, ultra-processed, you know, out of the ground, doesn't matter. If it does these three, if it does none of these three, it's poison. If it does one or two, but not all three, then it's going to be somewhere in the middle. But these are the three precepts. Next slide. So let's go through the, each of them relatively quickly because time is, you know, uh, short. Okay. Feed the gut <clears throat> means feed the, feed the bacteria, feed the microbiome. Okay. Why do you have to feed the microbiome? Because if you don't feed the microbiome, the intestinal bacteria, the microbiome will feed on you. Next slide. So here's what you have to feed it. You have to feed it fiber because fiber is the food of the bacteria. We took the fiber out for shelf life because you can't freeze fiber. I'll prove it to you. Take an orange when you go home, put it in your freezer overnight, take it out, put it on the uh, kitchen countertop the next morning, okay, let it thaw, try to eat it, see what you get. You get mush. Why do you get mush? Because the ice crystals macerate the cell wall, let all the water rush in. Hey, food industry knows that. So what do they do? Squeeze it and freeze it. Lasts forever. 
they have turned a food, an orange, into a commodity. Frozen concentrated orange juice, which you can sell on the commodities exchange. Anybody ever see trading places? <laughs> right, frozen concentrated orange juice, okay? Decreases depreciation, increases profit, kills your health. They've taken a food and turned it into a poison by taking away the fiber. Problem is, you don't have to declare that on the label. You don't know if the fiber's been stripped away or not, right? Well, there's a way to figure it out, but it's not easy, okay? Point is, go back, point is, if you have a fiber-rich diet, the mucin layer here in pink stays intact. If you have a fiber-free diet, the bacteria have to eat the mucin, in which case, now your intestinal epithelia are exposed. That leads to irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, leaky gut, which leads to systemic inflammation because all the cytokines and the bacteria are actually going into your bloodstream because you can measure it. And that goes to your liver and causes chronic metabolic <coughs> disease. Okay, next slide. And it's been shown that the more fiber you consume, the less all-cause mortality, the less coronary disease, the less type 2 diabetes, and the less colorectal cancer. Next slide. So the fiber is critical. Now, if you look at a wheat berry, there are three parts to it. Here's the germ, which is where all the good stuff is, which gets stripped out by the food industry because this is the stuff that goes rancid. The starch, that you part you know, that's the white stuff. And then there's the husk, the kernel, the fiber. Turns out the fiber is 25% of the weight of the kernel. So when you look at a, a loaf of whole grain bread in the grocery store, how can you tell whether it's whole grain? Just because they say it? Because there's no definition of whole grain at the USDA. If you start it with whole grain, you can call it whole grain. If you pulverize it, is it whole? How can you tell whether it's whole grain or not? You look at the total carbohydrate to the fiber ratio. If it's three to one or four to one, then it's whole grain. If it's five to one or above, they've done something to it. And they don't have to import it. That's a little trick that you can use. Point is, you shouldn't have to use that trick because whole grain should mean something, but the FDA has never defined it. And so the food industry basically has carte blanche to do whatever the hell they want, which they do. Okay, next slide. Next, protect the liver. What does that mean? Well, protect it from toxins, because the liver is, uh, job is to metabolize toxins, right? Well, what's the toxin that everyone is exposed to? Fructose, because it's like alcohol, okay? So not everyone's exposed to alcohol. Only 80% of the population, uh, sorry, 60% of the population is exposed to alcohol, but 100% of the population is exposed to fructose, right? And there are other toxins too, like for instance, uh, cadmium, okay? And uh, uh, insecticides and a bunch of other things that are in the, uh, in the environment. BPA, uh, uh, phthalates, uh, chlorpyrifos, insecticide, uh, and a whole host of other things that are called environmental obesogens. Next slide. I will prove to you that the liver matters. Here's what we call MRI fat fraction maps. So here is an obese person. Notice the love handles on the side. But I want you to take a look at this guy's liver. Okay, notice it's dark. 2.6% liver fat. This is normal. This is what you expect to see. This is an MHO, metabolically healthy obese. This guy will probably outlive you, okay, despite the excess weight. Now, this guy here in the center, he's got obesity, clearly, but take a look at his liver, 24% liver fat. That's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That's metabolic syndrome. That guy's going to die. Now take a look at this guy. Notice very little in the way of obesity. But take a look at his liver, 23% liver fat. This guy is as sick as this guy. But you wouldn't know it by looking at the outside. You have to look at the inside. Thin sick, fat sick, 
fat healthy. So it's not the fat you can see that counts, it's the fat you can't see. And that's why everyone is at risk, including everyone in this room. Next slide. And the reason is because glucose goes to glycogen in the liver, which is non-toxic. That's what you want glucose to do. That's why marathoners carb load before a race, is to raise their liver glycogen so they have, they can call on it when they're running. Fructose does not go to glycogen. It goes straight down to the mitochondria where you turn it into triglyceride and it will either be exported out, causing obesity, or it won't be, in which case it precipitates as a lipid droplet and now you've got fatty liver disease and chronic metabolic disease. Next slide. We at UCSF did this study many, now, now 10 years ago, seems like it was yesterday. We took 43 children from our clinic with metabolic syndrome, obesity plus at least one comorbidity. We examined, we evaluated them on their home diet, okay? And of course they all had fatty liver and high triglycerides. And then, next slide, we took the sugar out of their diet for nine days. We catered their meals, no added sugar. We took their percent calories from, of sh added sugar from 28% of calories down to 10% of calories. Now if you do that, you're gonna lose 350 to 400 calories a day out of the diet. Well, we, that would cause you to lose weight after 10 days. We didn't want them to lose weight, we wanted them to stay the same weight. Because if they lost weight, people, critics would say, well, of course they got better, they lost weight. We wanted them to stay the same weight. So we had to replace the sugar with something equicaloric. We gave them extra starch. So in the vernacular, we took the pastries out, we put the bagels in. We took the sweetened yogurt out, we put the baked potato chips in. We took the chicken teriyaki out, we put the turkey hot dogs in. So we didn't give them good food, we gave them crappy food. We gave them processed food. We gave them Safeway food, okay? But we gave them food kids would eat. But it was no added sugar food, all right? And we gave them a scale, and every day we'd call them up on the phone, what you weigh? And if they were losing weight, eat more! In order to keep their weight constant. And then we evaluated them 10 days later. Liver fat dropped by 22%. The novel epigenesis turning sugar into fat dropped by 46%. Triglyceride dropped by 49%. Visceral fat dropped by 7%. And most importantly, next slide, their pancreas has started working right. We reversed their risk for diabetes. We reversed their metabolic syndrome just by getting the fat out of their liver by taking the substrate that caused the fat away. Protect the liver. Wow. We protected the liver on the same number of calories. Because a calorie is not a calorie. It depends on what the calorie is. In addition, you gotta prevent inflammation of the liver. So here's your intestine. Here's that mucin layer right here in blue, here. Okay, here's the bacteria here. And there are these biochemical um, barriers in between each intestinal cell called tight junctions. The most famous of those are zonulins, which are what goes defective in celiac disease. Okay? If these tight junctions don't work, then stuff can get through in between and get into the bloodstream and end up in the liver. Not a good thing. So the goal is keep these intact. Well, what makes those tight junctions go bad? Next slide. Okay, um, well, gluten, of course, right? So, you know, for the people who are, cel you know, celiac, next slide. But guess what? Fructose nitrates, those tight junctions, causes leaky gut, causes translocation of those bacteria and lipopolysaccharides, and ends up leading to liver insulin resistance and inflammation, okay? And finally, the immunologic barrier, these TH17 cells. Notice on a high-fat diet, the Th17 cells are still there, and you keep that intestinal barrier okay. But on a Western-style diet with both high fat and high sugar, those Th17 cells disappear. You get these Th1 cells, and all hell breaks loose. So it's not the fat that's causing the problem. It's the sugar. And it's causing it by promoting inflammation, which leads to liver dysfunction, protect the liver. Protect the liver by fixing the gut. Next slide. In fact, um, 
Sugar consumption actually leads to worsening of virtually every autoimmune disease, like lupus. If you have an autoimmune disease, try going sugar-free and see if your autoimmune disease gets better. It will. Next slide. And the reason is because there are bacteria in your intestine which love fructose, especially this guy, group A strep. Group A strep loves fructose. Notice it doesn't even grow on, suc on, on glucose. Okay? It grows on fructose only. Okay? So the goal is keep that down because that's the driver of many of these autoimmune diseases. Next. So I'm not the only one who says this, you know? I mean, for a while, you know, like Reynolds said, you know, I was the you know, voice in the wilderness. You know, here's a, an article that came out in 2021. Sweet death, fructose as a metabolic toxin that targets the gut liver axis. You know, I'm still here. I'm still standing. You know, because, because the data show it. The data are right. And the point is that sugar is the marker for ultra-processed food. That's basically how you know whether or not something's ultra-processed. Did they add sugar to it? So if you see sugar on any of the, as any of the ingredients on the label, you know it's ultra-processed. The problem is there are 262 names for sugar. And you don't know them. They're on, you know, they're online, they're on my website, but the bottom line is you don't know them. And the food industry uses all of them on purpose because they can take a different sugar and make it number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, and when you add it up, it's number one. Okay? Breakfast cereal. Anybody like Kellogg's Honey Smacks? 56% sugar. The standard national school breakfast program breakfast is a bowl of Fruit Loops and a glass of orange juice. That is 41 grams of sugar. Okay. The upper limit for children is 12 for the whole day. That's 41, and it's just breakfast. Why are our children getting sick? That's why. Next slide. Okay. And finally, support the brain. Well, what, do you, what does that mean? Okay, next slide. Okay. What's your brain made of? It's made of fat. But what fat? What fat? Cholesterol. Well, <coughs> cholesterol is actually not a fat. Cholesterol is a, steer, a, a sterol, but it's, it's actually not a fat. What fat is in the brain? A lot of saturated fat. Not all saturated fat, but a lot of it. Next slide. Okay. And some of it's omega-6s and some of it's omega-3s. Well, omega-3s are necessary for neurotransmission. Next slide. Okay. So, this guy here, EPA, everybody heard of it? This is the thing that gives fish its fishy smell. <laughs> it's very hard to put in processed food because it's got a fishy smell. DHA is also necessary for neuronal structure. It's what you find in algal oil. Okay. Next slide. And finally, ALA, alpha-linolenic acid, this is what's in vegetables. And this has cardiovascular protection. No argument. So vegans will get cardiovascular protection. But these can only come from marine life. Okay? So it's a problem. Now, on the other side, we have omega-6s. Omega-6s are the precursor to arachidonic acid. This is guy over here. Linoleic acid is the bad guy. It makes arachidonic acid, and this is the precursor to virtually every inflammatory reagent that in your body. Prostaglandins, lymphocytes, leukotrienes. These are what are pro-inflammatory. So we're supposed to have an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of about 1 to 1, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1, maybe. Our current omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is 20 to 25 to 1 because we consume seed oils. Seed oils are virtually straight omega-6s. Omega-3s are in fish, but only wild fish because the fish eat the algae. The algae make the omega-3s. The fish eat the algae. We eat the fish. We get our omega-3s third hand, but what does farmed fish eat? It eats corn, omega-6s. So if you're going to eat farmed fish, you might as well eat a steak. <laughs> problem, problem for the whole middle of the country because they don't live next to a coast where they can get fresh fish. Okay? And in fact, omega, low omega-3s lead to irritability and depression. Next slide. Okay? 
and ADHD. 10% of America now has ADHD. Next slide. Okay, so the science is clear. The science is clear. You can take this one, take pictures of this one. Okay, because the science is clear. This is what we need to do. We need to feed the gut with fiber. We need to protect the liver from sugar. And we need to up the omega-3s. And the last thing that's not on that is emulsifiers. Emulsifiers lead to systemic inflammation because it leads to gut inflammation. Those are the four precepts of good metabolic health. Those are how you fix the food supply if you do those four things. But ultra-processed food is the exact opposite of that. Next slide. I am the co-founder and chief uh, science officer of a nonprofit here in the Bay Area, and we are down here in, uh, in Palo Alto, Palo Alto uh, uh, School District, called Eat Real. Anybody heard of it? No? Well, you should, okay? Eat Real gets real food into K-12 around the country. Okay, we have six states, we have 514 school districts. We get real food into K-12. Now, the question is, how do you do that? How do you get real food into K-12? They don't even have um, kitchens anymore. How'd that happen? Because in 1971, the Department of Education, in its infinite wisdom, passed an ordinance, you know, agency um, uh, 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 administrative law, called Resolution 242. And what this said was that Cafeterias in public schools had to make book. That is, they could not be loss leaders for the school. They had to fend for themselves. The school could not cover their costs. Now, what were the primary expenses of the, of the cafeteria? The lunch ladies, the personnel, right? Nonstop, uh, uh, you know, money out the door. So they all had to fire all the lunch ladies. So Food industry, uh, sorry, the cafeteria uh, uh, work, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, people who run the cafeterias, you know, the, the district uh, uh, food service directors, you know, scrambled. Well, what are we going to do? Well, in walks Aramark and Cisco and Guggenheim and McDonald's and says, and Pizza Hut and says, hey, we'll take care of the problem for you. We'll provide every kid with a air quote, nutritious meal, unquote, every single day, and you won't have to do anything, and we'll even take the same amount of money you spent so you don't have to worry about it. And most importantly, because the food will be made off site, you can take the infrastructure and the square footage devoted to food preparation, and you can turn it into classrooms because you will need them. And that's what they did. And that was their plan all along, because once you take the cafeteria equipment out of the school, now you're hostage to the food industry for the rest of that school's life. And that was the plan. And now every school in America is screwed because of this. A very specific plan to do this, to promote the food industry. Everybody got it? So how do you fix that when schools don't even have the ability to make their own food anymore? Never mind the lunch ladies. So that's where Eat Real comes in. We have developed a business plan for every single school district in the country. Different school districts need different plans. We have a multitude of different plans that we can employ. Basically what we do is we change how the food gets produced and distributed, and it gets done locally in centralized food preparation facilities, and then farmed out to each of the individual schools within the district, so that every kid gets a hot, nutritious meal where the nutrients are controlled, and it's done locally to reduce carbon footprint, and it's cheaper. It works, and that's why we're expanding. And if you want to support it, it is, you can find it at eatreal.org. To be honest with you, you know, our goal is to make this national. That's where we're going with this. Next slide. Okay, there it is right there. And the White House has actually commended us and is uh, on our side. Okay. Just announced like two weeks ago. Okay. 
The industry says, ha, it's all your own damn fault. Okay? Obesity, diabetes, you know, you did it to yourself. Yeah, maybe it's what you ate, but you know, you're in control of your own diet. You're in control of what ends up on your plate. You're in control of what's on your fork. You're in control of what goes in your mouth. Here are a bunch of different diseases that were all called personal responsibility diseases before the science was in, and we realized that these are all public health crises. Well, guess what? This is too. So this whole concept of personal responsibility just has to, you know, go bye-bye. Next slide. So, UK, more than 50%. US, 57% of all food consumed is ultra-processed, basically poison. Next slide. Okay? I did show you this already. So the question is, ultra-processed food, as much as I hate it, is not going away. And I'm not even sure we want it to go away because we have to feed 10 billion people by the year 2050. How are we going to do that? There's not enough land or ocean to do it. A, uh, a colleague who's the professor of sustainable agriculture at um, Michigan State University predicted years ago that by the year 2040, we would need four central valleys of California for just to cover the United States, and we won't even have one because of the soil erosion and the uh, water runoff and the climate change. It's like, how are we going to do it? He actually said this. I didn't say this, but he said it, and he might be right. The OBC problem is going to take care of itself because it will be famine. That will solve it. <laughs> Thought about that. Might be. Question is, is there a better way? Okay. Ultimately, we do need ultra-processed food. We do. As much as I hate it, you know, it's, it's a necessary evil. It's, what we, it's where we currently are. The question is, can you do something about it? And the answer is, yes, you can. All right? So these are some cut studies that, and uh, things that have been said about ultra-processed food. Next slide. Okay. Can technology help? Can we do something about it? Can Silicon Valley help? Maybe. Okay. So we have to change ingredients, like we talked about. We have to change processing. We have to change packaging and data science. Now the question is, what about AI? <laughs> Will AI solve the food problem? Of course. Yes or no? Do you think AI will solve any problem? Yes or no? AI is a tool. Well, tools can be used for good, or they can be used for bad, right? Nuclear power can, you know, power a you know, a city, or it can blow it up, right? A hammer can hammer a nail, or it can hammer a skull. You know, it depends on who's using it, right? A tool or technology does not have a good or bad associated with it. It's just a tool. So the question is, could you use AI for good? And the answer is, it could be, but it's not going to be. And here's the problem with AI. AI only knows what the internet knows. Okay? The AI scrapes the internet. The question is, what does the nutrition information on the internet look like? We've already demonstrated that 44% of all the nutritional information on the internet is wrong. So if you're going to make decisions based on wrong data, what do you expect? This is the ultimate garbage in, garbage out. Because the data uh, in the literature is polluted, and it was polluted by the food industry on purpose because that way they could sell all their products and say, oh, the data are inconclusive. This is actually a well-worn uh, strategy. So we know that. We, we understand that. In 2020, a company in the Middle East called Kuwaiti Danish Dairy, KDD company, the Nestle of the Middle East came to me and said, we want to be part of the solution. We want to be a metabolically healthy company. We know we sell poison. We want to fix that. We want to be on the right side of history. And because we're a privately held company and only the CEO and his sister, the CFO, own shares, they can afford to do it. They can take the long view. 
And so I said, okay, very interesting. So I convened a scientific advisory team, and here are the members of that team. Okay, uh, Tim Harlan is the head of culinary medicine at George Washington University. Rachel Gao is the person who did the ADD, uh, so the uh, omega-3 for ADD trial at the NIH. Andreas Kornstadt is a computer scientist here from here at Stanford. Wolfram Alderson started the first farmer's market in Los Angeles back in 1979, and me. And we spent the next three years evaluating every business and ingredient practice at KDD to determine the metabolic healthfulness of what they did. And we developed a method for biochemical analysis. We developed a method for grading their different uh, members uh, items in their portfolio, all 180 items, to determine whether or not they were poison or healthy. And it turned out they were all poison. <laughs> but we developed a set of principles to fix the food, and they have adopted it, and now they have turned over 10% of their portfolio to now be metabolically healthy. And guess what? They're selling. They haven't missed a beat. And do you know why they haven't missed a beat? Because they didn't tell the public. <laughs> Because if you tell the public it's healthier for you, everyone says it tastes like shit. <laughs> it's been shown. Do you know who showed that? Tom Robinson showed that, right here from Stanford. Okay, Don't tell the public. That's what we did. We didn't tell the public. And they're consuming it, they're, and they're just as delighted. And it's metabolically healthy now because we fixed it. So what did we do? We did these things right here. Okay, and we published this in Frontiers in Nutrition last year. So we're on our one year anniversary, March 30th, will be one year. Next slide. Oops, sorry. So we tested all of these things in the, you know, uh, but through biochemical analysis through a company called Eurofins, which actually, you know, did the HPLC analysis, did the GC mass spec, et cetera, to figure out what was in the food because KDD didn't even know what was in the food. They only knew what the vendors told them what was in the food. Turned out they were lying. They're all lying. In fact, the USDA knows they're all lying. We've proved it, because we looked at the branded foods database of the USDA from Hyattsville, Maryland. It's all wrong. They know it. They told us that. Next slide. So, this was the original chocolate milk. This is the new chocolate milk. This is the original chocolate ice cream. This is the new chocolate ice cream. Okay, you can see, I mean, I'm not gonna read all the ingredients off for you, but the point is, we have re-engineered, not reformulated, but re-engineered the entire structure of the company to be a metabolically healthy company. And we're publishing the results to provide a roadmap for the rest of the food industry to be able to follow. Next slide. So, how about sugar? This is you know, near and dear to my heart. <laughs> there are five ways to get sugar down. Remove, reduce, replace, boost, block. And there are different companies working in each of these. I happen to be the chief medical officer of one that does blocking, okay, called Biolum. Okay, and this is our product right here. It was just released three months ago. It is called Monch Monch. Okay, I didn't make up the name. <laughs> the, the marketers did that. And had no say in that. Next slide. Okay, we were written up in the Guardian just two weeks ago. Okay. Uh, February, February 24th, sorry, three weeks ago now. All right, can we have our cake and eat it too? Welcome to the world of sugar elimination. What is this, next slide. It is, oh, oh, we've seen this already, go ahead. It is a microcellulose sponge. It's a sponge like the sponge you use on your kitchen countertop, except it's seven microns in diameter. It's the size of a red blood cell, so it flows like a powder. It's colorless, odorless, tasteless, textureless. Because it's seven microns, the tongue can't tell it's there. So you can put it in anything that's not aqueous. So you can put it in chocolate, you can put it in microwave lasagna, you can put it in bean dip, you can put it in yogurt, you can put it in ice cream. Tomorrow starts Future Food Tech in San Francisco and we are giving out vanilla ice cream and chocolate candies made with bioluminum to demonstrate to the public what it, what it is and the fact that you can't tell it's there. Okay. No FDA approval required because all of the components are food. They're all 
components normally found in food. They're all grass. They're all generally recognized as safe by the FDA, and we didn't do anything to them. It's just fiber. It's just fiber. It's cellulose and hydrogels. Okay? The hydrogels soak up the sugar. So one gram of bioalumin soaks up six grams of carbohydrate. So it renders it unavailable for absorption in the gut, thus reducing the glycemic response, reducing the insulinemic response. Carries it further down the intestine where the microbiome will chew it up for its own purposes, feeding the gut, and turning it into short-chain fatty acids, which have been shown to be anti-inflammatory, anti-Alzheimer's. In other words, what we're doing is we're recapitulating what f the fiber that the food industry took out, we're putting it back in. We are turning apple juice back into apples in the intestine. How bad could that be? Next slide. So this is what it looks like. This is the, when it starts, and this is in the stomach, and this is what happens in the intestine. And this, all the little nooks and crannies that have got the hydrogels that soak it up, and all of those hydrogels are just part of food. Next slide. They're all things you consume now. Okay, so. In the stomach, it gives you a feeling of fullness. In the small intestine, you get, uh, you get the uh, uh, benefits of uh, not absorbing it. It goes further down, and you get the um, uh, uh, short-chain fatty acid formation. Next slide. Okay. So we tested it in this contraption here. It's called the Shine system. It's an artificial alimentary tract. So here's the stomach over here, here's the small intestine over here, and here's the colon over here. So you can actually sample from each so you can know what went on. Next slide. And you can see that we were able to reduce glucose absorption by 33%, fructose by 36%, uh, sucrose by 38%, uh, simple starches by 9%, and we increased short-chain fatty acid production by 60%. Now, if you eat a lot of carbohydrate, you might get gas. Only a 15% increase over, uh, over control in terms of carbohydrate production. We tested this against inulin. Inulin is what the food industry currently uses as when they put fiber in fiber one bars, they're putting inulin in. 60% increase in gas. Ours was 15. So the question is, if you put this into people, will they notice? Next slide. So the first thing we did was we tested it with a candy bar. So one day, they ate, uh, uh, normal people ate a candy bar, and here's their glucose response, and the next day they ate the candy bar plus bioalumin, and you can see the attenuation here, the more rapid fall, and notice no hypoglycemia here at the end. So no irritability, no hunger, no going back for another cookie. Next slide. Okay, and we have done clinical trials now, two double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials, we showed reduction in glucose, insulin, insulin resistance, blood pressure, body fat, must, and improving muscle mass, HDL, stool consistency, butyrate gut health, satiety. Not one person in either of the two studies stopped it for side effects. In fact, if they had constipation when the study started, on bioalumin they didn't. If they had diarrhea when the study started, on bioalumin they didn't. If they had abdominal pain when the study started, on bioalumin they didn't. It actually cleared their GI symptoms because it's fiber. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, and here's the insulin and here's the glucose. And you can see without the uh, uh, bioluminum, much higher response and with the bioluminum, much lower. Next slide. So, last slide. Are there ways to fix metabolic health? Yes, there are. We can solve this problem, but Congress is not going to solve it. We have to solve it. The question is, how do you solve it? Well, you solve it one population at a time, that's called public health. You solve it one patient at a time, that's called personal intervention, that's what your doctor does. And finally, one company at a time, that's called technological innovation. We are working at all levels to try to fix the problem. But this is the true purpose of nutrition, metabolic health. And if you believe that, which I hope you do after hearing all of this, okay, you have to go home and you have to basically take your entire pantry and throw it in the friggin' garbage <laughs> and start over. That's how you solve this problem. 
and you need to then tell your friends and then hopefully they will do the same. And you need, most importantly, to tell your doctor because your doctor thinks they know something. <laughs> and they don't. And I didn't, truly, for the first 20 years that I practiced. I practiced like everybody else, like they taught me. But you know, nutrition is not taught in medical school. Sophia, did you learn any nutrition in medical school? Not a damn thing. Only 28% of medical schools even have a nutrition curriculum. Okay? And those that do, only 19.6 contact hours. When you consider a medical education, 6,000 contact hours. 19.6 contact hours to solve 75% of all the healthcare costs in America. You know, this is pretty ridiculous. The point is, we think this is fixable by a pill. It's not. There is no pill for this. There's only the food. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions, and I really thank you for sticking it out. Thank you for Unfortunately, we only have one mic, but if anybody wants, to, oh, we have two mics? Cool. So I'm going to be the question runner, and I will give you back the mic. So if anybody has questions, please raise your hands, and I will come to you. I'm going to start from the front and work my way back. John. Yeah, so I've always been suspect of the U.S. Um, you know, uh, food industry, and I'm wondering, countries like Japan, are their food industries doing anything different, and is that part of the reason why they have a longer lifespan? So they, first of all, if you look at the Japanese diet, what is it? It's fish, and fermented soybeans, and vegetables, and now high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> Okay. They are not doing as well as they used to, and there's a huge metabolic syndrome problem in Japan, but it pales in comparison to ours. And the reason is because the rest of their diet's good. The traditional Japanese diet is good. Okay? Even the white rice is not disastrous. It's not as good as the brown rice, but you know, that's that's their thing. You know, it's white rice, that's fine. But they eat a boatload of fish and vegetables. Their omega-3s way high, their omega-6s are way low, okay? They, that's one of the reasons they have this longevity benefit. But yes, they now have high fructose corn syrup and it is a huge problem and it is a driver of metabolic syndrome in Japan, no argument. And they do know that it's a problem, but they have the same, you know, problems reining it in like we do. Hello, Dr. Lustig, thank you so much for sharing this message. I was wondering, do you have a lot of research on the, uh, the, the types of behaviors that would be helpful, like changing uh, the diet? Are there, is there data or, or clinically validated ways of delivering the message in a way that's shown to be effective to cause the behavior change? Ah, wow. Okay. How do you effectuate behavior change? <laughs> wow. If I knew that, I'd have won the Nobel Prize. I made a trillion dollars by now. Okay? This is a problem. You know, how do you effectuate behavior change? The problem with behavior is that virtually every behavior is not based on data or science, it's based on a belief system, okay? You believe that something's gonna work, so you mod modulate your behavior to conform with your belief system. So in order to change behavior, you have to change the belief system. That's the, that's, and that's kind of hard to do. So, here's the question. What religion are you? But you gave up Catholicism. Not really. Not really. <laughs> Did you ever think about being Jewish? Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. Good. When I, when I was a kid in 1970, two percent of Americans changed their religion. Today it's 24 percent. Now, why is that? Why did this big change occur over this period of time? Well, clearly the belief system wasn't working for them, so they were, people are searching for new belief systems that they can believe in. Because after all, there is no religion that I know of that has evidence base, okay? There are 4,200 religions in the world, 
Okay? And if there were, any of them had an evidence base, there'd only be one. Okay? Point is, if the, uh, if the, uh, if the uh, belief system is working for you, you have no reason to change. Even when the belief system is not working for you, you, have, you know, it's very hard to change. Okay? This is what we are currently dealing with. So the question is, how do you change a belief system? Okay? It's, hard, it's a hard question, to, to, be, to be very clear. Very hard. Sorry. And this is what I did in the obesity clinic like every friggin' day. <laughs> That's why my hair is great. <laughs> so, um, here's a way to think about it. Let's say there's a brick wall between the two of us right now. Okay? And my job is to get from my side of the brick wall to your side of the brick wall. There are three ways to do it. The first is I can blow a hole in the wall, in which case you get scared. That ain't going to work very well. Second way, I can try to walk around the wall. And that'll work sometimes. But what if the wall's circular? and you're actually in a cylinder, and I just keep going around and around. Or, I can dismantle the wall, brick by brick by brick, and you can see what I'm doing, and so you can see I'm not a threat, and then I reassemble the wall with me on the other side. That's the way to effectuate behavior change. It's time consuming, it's highly problematic, it can you know, go wrong at any given moment, okay? But ultimately, that's what we have to do. And we have to do it with two pieces of data. We have to do it with cognitive data, that is, you know, statistical analysis, you know, uh, uh, science. And we have to do it with visceral data. And what is vis uh, visceral uh, data? Stories. Okay? And you have to do both at the same time. Okay? And through that, you can actually effectuate behavioral change. This is what we do with eating disorders. This is what we do with, you know, Obesity, this is what we do with cardiovascular disease. Okay? It's a talent, to be sure. You know, and you know, cl some clinicians are good at it and some aren't. But ultimately, that's how you effectuate behavioral change. I don't know another way. I wish I did. You know, maybe electroshock. But, but that that would be tough too. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Bill. Okay, I'll go next. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yes. Um, make sure make sure we get the bill. Yes, absolutely. Bill's my buddy. Thank you so much for the excellent talk. I attended your talk about four years ago, and there's so much new info here. So very much appreciate that. Um, my question is: We know we've been told that uh, certain sugar substitutes are bad, mm -hmm. such as saccharin and sucralose, because they harm the good bacteria in the gut. But what about? I'd love your opinion on stevia and erythritol. And then on lectins. On lectins? Yeah. Lectins. Okay. Uh, so the question is artificial sweeteners. If you're trying to reduce sugar, what about artificial sweeteners? Remember I had those five uh, modalities, reduce, replace, uh, uh, remove, boost, block. So replace is artificial sweeteners. That's basically what we're talking about. Can you replace sugar with artificial sweeteners? So the short answer is the toxicity of one Coca-Cola equals the toxicity of two Diet Coca-Colas. We have the data now, okay? So, half is bad. Now half is bad does not mean good. It means half is bad, okay? Now the problem with half is bad is that people say, hey, no sugar, no calories, I'll drink 10 of them like some orange guy who used to inhabit the White House, okay? The problem is that that means five times the, the morbidity and mortality, the toxicity, okay? Now, the question is, or what would be the mechanism if there's no fructose and no calories? You put something sweet on the tongue, message goes tongue to brain, sugar's coming, message goes brain to pancreas through the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve and the uh, posterior branch of the uh, vagus nerve and releases the insulin anyway. And the insulin's driving adiposity and the insulin's driving chronic metabolic disease. So even though it has no calories, the sweet taste alone is enough to drive insulin release, especially when it's teamed up with other foodstuffs. So that's one problem. Second problem, 
the work, uh, the, the, the group from uh, Weizmann Institute in Rehoboth, Israel, uh, Elanov's group, has demonstrated that most of the artificial sweeteners, not all, but most of them, aspartame and sucrose in particular, alter the microbiome and induce glucose intolerance because they promote leaky gut, having nothing to do with fructose or calories, just because of their own biochemical nature. Stevia apparently does not do this in their assay, so maybe stevia is better, but you know, there are questions because it's still gonna release the insulin, so it's still an issue. And erythritol you asked about. So erythritol is a sugar alcohol. It acts as an osmolite in the intestine, so if you consume enough erythritol for it to be sweet enough to actually flavor something, okay, it's going to lead to, as an osmolite to water uh, retention, and you're gonna get GI distress and diarrhea and bloating and what have you. And a paper came out in Nature last year showing that erythritol consumption was associated with cardiovascular disease anyway. So are there artificial sweeteners that might be better? Maybe, maybe. Uh, allulose looks like a promising candidate. The data so far on allulose, we don't have long-term data, but we have short-term, like one month to two month data. It reduces LDL, it raises HDL, it doesn't appear to have any GI side effects. It might actually be metabolically beneficial. It's one of the things that we are using for this KDD project. The problem with allulose is not the uh, uh, compound itself, it's the price, because right now it's 12 times the price of sugar. But there are now two separate um, uh, technological breakthroughs in terms of scaling it. One from UC Davis, my colleague Justin Siegel was involved in that. And so this is going to bring the price of allulose down significantly. And so this might become you know, sort of the next thing. You know, but there are others, there's tagatose, and there's a, you know, a bunch of different uh, artificial sweeteners that are being experimented with right now. Um, and then the last question you asked was lectins. about lectins. So lectins are things that bind up stuff in, in, in your food that you know, will basically reduce the bioavailability of various things. So lectins are not good, but I'm not sure how bad. It depends on what you've consumed. So some uh, foods have more than others. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Lustig. Thank you so much for your talk. My name is Ava Satnik. I'm a physician and I'm trained in pediatrics and integrative medicine. I studied nutrition prior to going to medical school. You did. And yeah. Uh, with uh, any of this, any of this, a hundred percent. Okay, one hundred percent. And I can also vouch that I got two weeks of online education once I went to medical school. So <laughs> four years versus two weeks made a big difference. Cool. So your words are just sweetness in my ears. I don't need the sugar. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, as I treat patients on my own now, I do integrative medicine. I use more holistic modalities, mind-body medicine. Right. I'm seeing that chronic stress affect kids just as much as the chronic sugar intake. Sure, agree. And how we eat. Two different mechanisms, but yes, for sure. But ha is how we eat, in your opinion, just as important as what we eat? For sure, no question. Yeah. How we eat is even more important for babies. So I actually give a talk called Babies Eating Badly. <laughs> And the reason is because sucking on mom's breast actually grows the airway because of the negative pressure of the tongue on the hard palate. And chewing when you're six months old increases the masseter, the temporalis, and the medial and lateral pterygoids to grow the airway. And turns out that if you grow the airway, then you don't suffer from malocclusion. If you don't suffer from malocclusion, you don't get obstructive sleep apnea as an adult. And so chronic disease actually starts before the baby's even born, right? So yes, what they eat matter, I mean, I mean, how they eat and what they eat both matter. And of course it's true for adults too, obviously, you know, uh, you know, the more pureed the food is, especially in, you know, childhood, you know, the worse it is. And also the, you know, faster 
things will be absorbed. Therefore, the bigger the glucose spike, the bigger the insulin spike. And of course, that drives chronic metabolic disease and obesity all by itself. So yeah, absolutely. And not just the fiber. By the way, fiber is the way to fix that. Yeah. But beyond the mechanics, what I'm asking also about is um, the parasympathetic versus sympathetic response when we're eating. Are we in rest and digest mode or are we in fight or flight? Oh, wow. OK. Um, that's, a, that's a loaded question. Um, so we should be in parasympathetic mode. But we're not. But we're not because of the stress. And yes, that is having major effects. So here's the problem with the sympathetic nervous system. I give a talk on this as well, not tonight. Um, <laughs> the sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is lipolytic. It should cause release of free fatty acids from adipose tissue. It should cause the loss of fat from fat depots, right? Except chronic stress does the opposite. It causes the gaining of fat in fat depots. Why is that? Why does acute stress cause fat loss and chronic stress causes fat gain? So the short answer is, well, people who are chronically stressed eat. Yeah, that's true, but that ain't it. And the reason we know that is because people who have chronic depression, major depressive disorder, are losing weight because they're anhedonic, they're not eating, that's part of why they have chronic depression. They're suicidal, they have to be admitted to the hospital to save them from themselves. You stick them in an MRI scanner, and it turns out that their subcutaneous fat's gone down because they're not eating. Their visceral fat's gone up. How did their visceral fat go up if they're not eating? If their subcutaneous fat's gone down, why is their visceral fat going up? Because their sympathetic nervous system is chronically overstimulated. They're actually in a hypermetabolic state, which is one of the reasons why they're losing weight. But when your sympathetic nervous system is in chronic overstimulation mode, you're not just releasing norepinephrine anymore. You are releasing neuropeptide Y which is a neuromodulator that goes along. Every sympathetic neuron in your, every uh, norepine containing, or every catecholaminergic neuron in your body contains neuropeptide Y also, okay? And in the chronic phase, that is the break on the sympathetic nervous system. That's what keeps it from basically overdoing it. And what it does is it actually promotes lipogenesis and binds to the Y2 receptor, the MPY binds to the Y2 receptor and stops the sympathetic nervous system effect from working. And so that's what's driving the lipogenesis. The only way to turn that off is to stop the sympathetic nervous system. So that's why. Bill. It was interesting to hear the name of Ignaz uh, Semmelweis. Yeah, oh, I love that, that. Reynolds, that, that, that yeah. I but know that story, and to be compared to Semmelweis is you know, both a blessing and a curse. <laughs> but, but I was thinking of the the sequel to that was that uh, it, when he was practicing that the paradigm was if, it's, if you can't see it, it can't hurt you. Right. So fast forward 25 years and Pasteur and Dr. Robert Koch come along, a French, a German and French chap said, who were competitors and they said no, what, they proved what you can't see can't hurt you, can yep. tell you. Yep. So then that eventually made it into the medical schools by about 1900. Right. So it took quite a while, it took 50 years to, to get into medical school. Now, there were still plenty of doctors in practicing and who weren't part of that. So when the Spanish flu came along, came along in 1918, there was a lot of misdiagnosis due to the fact they were just not informed. Some of them were. So it takes quite a while to actually, are we gonna do better than that? No, we're never gonna do better than that. Because that's the nature of medicine. It takes 25 years from a discovery to actually hit medical practice. 25 years. And there doesn't seem to be anything that speeds that up, even though we've tried. So I, you know, I, I'm, 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 I don't want to be a naysayer or a negativist, but that's one of the reasons why we've known about this since 2007, and now it's 2024, and finally NPR is saying something. It took 17 years to get this far. Maybe that's better than 25. I don't know. But no, Bill, it, your your point is very well taken. Yes. Yeah. So, Doctors are very provincial. Our last question, and Dr. Lustig will be around to answer individual questions. We do have 
to clean up and get out of here by 9.30 so if you all can help us fold chairs, move chairs while he answers questions. But this is the last question, sorry. Um, hi, Dr. Rustic, big fan of your videos. Discovered them a few months ago and I've been changing my diet um, a lot. So I've, I've caught all the fructose from my diet except for whole fruits. Um, Great. Okay. I, so, so I want to talk about glucose and like, you know, what's your recommendation on like, how how should I take carbs in order to avoid diabetes? Is there a specific time should I use with their or? fiber? Okay. With their fiber. So, when I said glucose was good, I was being a little disingenuous. <laughs> glucose is not as bad. The reason is because glucose still causes glycation. Okay? Glucose still causes oxidative stress. Glucose, anything that uh, goes through the mitochondria will generate reactive oxygen species, including glucose. Okay? It's not like glucose is a walk in the park, but compared to fructose, it is a walk in the park. The reason is because glucose only releases one-seventh the number of reactive oxygen species that fructose does. Now, when you consume glucose straight, white bread, you get a blood glucose response. That blood glucose response means your blood glucose goes up in your blood vessels. Well, that glucose causes endothelial cell dysfunction. It changes endothelial one levels. It causes changes in the vasculature. It changes nitric, endogenous nitric oxide synthase, raises blood pressure acutely, and then it comes back down, all right? The more you do that, the more damage you do long term. But fructose does it seven times more, so a bigger problem, okay? So it's not that glucose is great. The goal is to keep your blood glucose down as much as you possibly can. This is one reason why a lot of people are now wearing continuous glucose monitors. And I am, full disclosure, I am a advisor to Levels Health, which is a company that this, you know, to take, integrates CGM data from either Freestyle, Libre, or Dexcom. Use, you know, integrates it and then disseminates it to the patient so that they can actually learn what their food did to their blood glucose because changing your blood glucose has negative effects on your health. And the more you can keep it stable, the better off you are. And we now have data showing the more stable we keep it, the more weight you lose. And the reason is because the more stable you keep it, the lower your insulin response. Therefore, the more weight you can lose. You can't lose weight unless you get the insulin down. Every single piece of data that I have seen and that I have generated in my entire career says insulin's the bad guy in this story. Well, glucose makes insulin go up. So keeping your glucose down is a good idea. How do you keep your glucose down? Well, don't eat glucose. All right, that's called a ketogenic diet. Does a ketogenic diet work? Sure, it does work. The question is, can you stay on it? Okay. Numerous studies show that in the field, without any uh, uh, monitoring or medical uh, uh, help, people who just do a ketogenic diet, two months later, are not on a ketogenic diet. They have regressed to the mean. Uh, carbohydrate has slipped into their diet, whether they meant to or not. And then, when you're, when you're there, when that happens, you're, not only are you not ketogenic, but now you're on a high fat, medium carbohydrate diet. And that's like the worst diet you can be on. <laughs> so, if you're going to do a ketogenic diet, you have to be fastidious. You have to actually know what you're doing. You have to use monitoring. So there's a breath ketone monitor that um, is made by Journeys Metabolic called, um, uh, I'm, I'm an advisor to it, so I, I should know the name of it. Um, it's called uh, Ketosense, uh, or Ketotap, there's a, is a, um, a inline, uh, you know, wearable that uh, can be used. Uh, so you have to know your ketones. You can measure your blood ketones, you can measure your urine ketones, but you have to know you're still ketogenic if you're going to do that. Um, but the best way is just keep your blood glucose relatively stable, and the easiest way to do that is with fiber, <coughs> because fiber reduces the rate of glucose absorption, thereby keeping your blood glucose down. And I showed you that with the candy bar. That's the best way. And BioLumen will do that, but to be honest with you, I'd rather you eat real food. <laughs> All right.
was a, a, a choir a, a, a concert a contest is uh, uh, in Cambridge. Oh, so okay. excited. Great. Well, I can't thank you enough. I also want to remind everyone that we have a fantastic lineup of events for the rest of the year. And the theme of metabolic health, we actually have an event uh, one month from now, exactly four weeks from now, oh. with uh, Sam Inkinen, the oh, CEO of Orta, and the Chief Product Officer, um, plus a, an obesity uh, clinic doctor uh, who runs in our health. His name is Rami Bayoun. He's actually at UCSF right now. Rami Bayoun. I know the name. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So that's in April. We hope to see uh, many of you there. And then in, uh, in May, we've got a women's health event right in time for uh, for Women's uh, Month, which is May, and Sophia Yan is organizing that. And then we've got another policy event to close off the year in June with the NIH and Color Health talking about evolving standards of care. So a packed schedule, and if you want to help us volunteer, to be, this is all run by volunteers, um, just raise your hand, volunteer, then like our current volunteers, don't know. Yeah, so just come talk to me or talk to anybody with their hands raised, Tammy's. And yeah, yeah, why not? And uh, and we meet every uh, other week for 15 minutes. We just coordinate what we're going to do, and and um, any help is, is appreciated. We uh, we love doing this. And, you know. So thank you very much, and uh, whoever can stay to help us clean up would be appreciated.